Okay, can you see the slide? Yeah. Yeah, protein for you and me. Yes. Okay, uh, let's start. The reason why I call it protein for you and me is because we are not athletes, we are not bodybuilders, we are not, uh, you know, super duper people who are extent. We are, except for Shankar, who is an athlete, most of us are not. And even Satya also. Yeah, 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 yeah. Satya as well. Every day I play four hours uh, shuttle badminton, uh, Jitan. Ah, good, good, good. But generally, we still don't fall under the real sport people who do sport for uh, as a job, as a as a yeah. full time job. You know, that's what I meant. What I meant was not we are not professional athletes, right? So we are general general people. So this protein talk is basically for you and for us. Okay. So I've not included bodybuilding and all because the, the need for protein is different there. And, and will be very, very, uh, be a higher, higher amount of protein that is required. So this disclaimer, is this talk is independent. It is not sponsored. I have asked the pharma company, this Anglo-French, to give me the spot because I'm a, I'm a medical advisor for them. So they have an account. So I think they, they're more than happy to you know, share this uh, Zoom with us. Okay, so what is protein? Basically, proteins are, we know they're made up of amino acids. Okay, and and depending on the amount of amino acids, you get dipeptide, tripeptides, and a lot more uh, amino acids, which are called polypeptides. So, if you look at the types of amino acids, we we can classify them into essential amino acids, non-essential, and special amino acids. So, so can you see the uh, can you see my cursor? Yeah. 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 Okay. So essential amino acids are those which uh, we do not make in the body. These have to be given, uh, we has, has to be taken via food. The non-essentials are some, most of them can be made by the, in the body by breaking down of other amino acids or uh, by the, uh, in the, uh, the kind of reserves that we have. And then of course we have special amino acids which are required for like, things like GABA, that's GABA amino butyric acid. And things like taurine. Uh -huh. Nobody talks about taurine. Taurine is a very important amino acid, and taurine is uh, is one of the very, very, very interesting amino acids in Red Bull. Okay, and taurine is required. If if a child doesn't have taurine, the child will not survive. So taurine is another important amino acid. These special amino acids. Now, if you look at one minute, I don't know why my Okay, so if you look at the why we need amino acids, basically we have a pool of amino acids, free amino acids. The protein that we take in the body is is a, is absorbed in the gut, usually the lower gut, and and the duodenum and uh, the first part of the duodenum, the second part of the duodenum, most of the times, and that is absorbed into the uh, amino acid pool. And this amino acid pool provides amino acids and uh, building material for all the different needs of the body, including muscle including um, uh, your uh, proteins for uh, uh, immune system and everything, okay? So we know what, as, a medical, as medical people, we know what the symptoms of protein insufficiency is. I'm not talking about protein deficiency. Protein energy malnutrition is very rarely seen in rural areas. I mean, very rarely seen in urban areas, maybe in some parts of rural areas, but it is not that common these days. So I'm not talking about protein energy, PEM, protein energy, malnutrition. I'm talking about protein insufficiency, where we have a problem in protein synthesis for muscle, problem in, in, in the serum, uh, albumin, endocrine imbalances, thyroid problems. And these are the different anemia. And so all these challenges, all these challenges are the challenges that we face on an everyday basis because of the challenge of protein intake. The question is how much how much protein do we need as regular people? You know, not so non bodybuilders. Okay, so before I get into that, we need to see what what does a protein do? Where does it go? So if you look at the left diagram here, left diagram here, the body mm -hmm. is. We can look at the composition of our body in, at various levels: Atom, atomic, atomic, molecular, oh, cellular, and tissue systems. Okay. Okay. So I'm interested in this molecular kind of area, which is which is what is what is on the right side. So if you if you put a person in a DEXA machine, you know what a DEXA is, right? We we check bo bone compositions using yeah. a DEXA. Mm -hmm. Now DEXA can also measure soft tissue. Okay, it only okay. It, it can measure muscle and it can measure fat. 
it's actually a very good machine to check it. It's very accurate. So mm -hmm. if you put someone under that, uh, under a DEXA, it will give you a total body weight, and then it will give you how much fat you have and how much water and protein. So you can calculate the rest. So the the if you minus the total weight by the body fat or percentage, you get the lean muscle mass, lean body weight. Okay, and from that you can get the various connections of uh, the the quadrants of protein, yeah, minerals, and bones. Sorry. Hmm? Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Okay, so now why, why am I putting this here? Because what, one thing we have to remember is whatever we are going to eat and whatever we are has to be addressed as a body composition. We are not taught about this in medical college. Okay, so basically, if you look at a healthy, a healthy woman, she has about 36% of muscle, and this can vary. This is just a number. It can vary between 36 to 45 and there is something called essential fat and storage fat, which are very important. Essential fat means the fat that you need for everyday use. And storage fat is the fa fat that you need in case you don't get enough food and the body will use uh, that fat for energy. And then, of course, we have bones and others. So if you look at male and female, male have more muscle than female. So males usually between 45 to 55, depending on where you are. I'm not talking about bodybuilders. I'm talking about general uh, yeah. non-bodybuilders, body athletes. Yeah. And essential fat in men. So in men, we are looking at a fat percentage of about okay. 10 to 20%. Okay. And in women, we're looking at a fat percentage of about 20 to 30%. Okay, and and muscle is very important, and and I will I want to talk a little bit on muscle. So uh, this is a slide which shows the different body fat composition of different people. So depending on male and age, the amount of body fat will we are very interested in fat more than anything. So I just put this slide here. But the problem with this is that this is the problem. So we we look at BMI. Just focus on this slide because if you look at these two people on the right side, these two images. If you look at their weight, they are the same, okay? Both 105 kgs, both have the same height, but, and both have the same BMI. But if you look at the body composition, the person on the left has got 35% body fat. The person on the right has got 5% body fat. The person on the left has got 20% muscle and the person on the right has 70% muscle, but the BMI is the same. You see, that's because muscle also has a lot of weight and mass. You got it? So BMI is not necessarily the best way to check weight and use. It's a good tool to use, but it is not a very accurate tool. That's the reason why I wanted to put this on. Okay. So, so the best way to do it is to actually check how much muscle and, and body fat we have. So why skeletal muscle? We don't talk much about the skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle is one of the most important organs in our body, which is a very, very important paracrine and endocrine organ. And the, and the skeletal muscle, you know, it, it circulates and it, it basically secretes a lot of uh, hormones called as myokines. And these myokines are very important for the immune system. They are very important, like BDNF is brain-derived nerve, nerve, nerve factor, which is very important for brain development and neurogenesis. It's very important for glucose metabolism in the pancreas. And so basically, your adipose tissue, cardiovascular, so this, and, but we don't talk much about the skeletal system. This is the, this is the saddest part. Because skeletal system is seriously one of the most important things. And I keep telling my patients and my, my family or anybody who was interested that we cannot increase the size of our liver to keep to store something. Okay. Our brain uses about 60% of the energy that we consume. But we cannot increase the size of the brain, luckily or unluckily, because the brain is within the capacity of its calvaria. So the only organ that we can adjust and keep going is skeletal muscle. You got it? It's very, very, very important. So skeletal muscle, we know that when we age, when we age, if you look at a 22-year-old 22, 22 and a 78-year-old, look at the amount of muscle difference in, in the body composition. It really, really drops. And this one becomes a huge problem, whereas the fat goes up. Okay? So it is very important. And aging is now ex associated with, uh, with loss of muscle. And we are, we, are, we are in this stage where if you don't take enough muscle and pro have good protein, we're going to end up, end up into in something called as loss of functionality. 
We also know, very important, is that people who have muscle wasting or have low muscle mass will have huge problems when it comes to, uh, when it comes to recouping, recouping from diseases. I've just given an example here with patients with cirrhosis. Without sarcopenia, they have a better survival rate. When, when they have low muscle mass, their survival rate drops quite a bit. Now, the next problem we have is this muscle. Muscle strength has really become optional. Nobody looks into muscle strength because everybody talks about fat. So you even nobody takes the stairs. Every time I see a set of stairs next to an elevator, I will try my best to take the set of stairs because we need to. It's become just a, you know, a common thing for people to use escalators everywhere. So the strength has become optional, which is a problem. Our strength has also become unfashionable because everybody here doesn't have muscle. They're all skinny and thin. And that to us seems to be fashionable in fashion. So everybody's like looking at, at people and going, I've become as thin as possible, which is not actually necessary. And what has happened is we have become fat obsessed. We are fat centric. We, we, are, uh, we think of unfat, high fat, low fat. How do we get fat? How fat? how we can unfat. So we have become so fat centric that we are not even looking into skeletal muscle. And what happens to us when we grow old is then we'll have these problems of holding or even a cup of coffee or maybe a glass of whiskey, but it'll be shaking so much because we don't have any, any more strength in our muscles. And that is what happens to us when we age. And this we are seeing this, but the real problem is this one. If you look at this, this, this slide, on the left side, what you're seeing is sarcopenia, means low muscle mass, okay? On the right side, you're seeing obesity. But what is happening today is this sarcopenia, which we used to define earlier as muscle loss in people above 60 or 70 years old, is happening to younger people today. In other words, if I ask my daughter to hang from a bar or something, she will say no. She'll just laugh about it because nobody has strength. Whereas when we grew up, we grew up on mango trees, literally in mango season, you know, jumping on trees. And we grew up with, with our muscles, developing our muscles. Whereas the new generation, there is no muscle development. There's no good sport. There is no good exercise. So what we are seeing today is sarcopenia in young people, which is very, very dangerous. And what we are seeing in general population is something called a sarcopenic obesity which means that our people are becoming obese with low muscle mass, which is really a dangerous point. And so, and then what happens is when we grow old, there is, if you look at this dotted line here, this dotted line is something called as a leucine threshold. You must have heard about something called as BCAAs, branch chain amino acid, the very commonly used by people who go to the gym or athletes. Now BCAA is, is our three amino acids, that is leucine, isoleucine, and valine. And leucine is, is a very important amino acid, which is a reference point for the body to, to make sure that if you have enough leucine, it, it thinks that we have enough protein and then it makes muscle, or there is muscle protein synthesis. But what happens when we age is that this leucine threshold changes. So we need more protein when we age, much more than when we were younger which doesn't happen because people think we're growing old, we don't need as much protein, which is the biggest problem that we have today. So how much protein do we need? If you look at the ICMR or the NIN, the National Institute of Nutrition, they tell us that we need one gram per kg body weight of protein per day. Okay, this is pretty much standard. It's 0.8 to one, but one is an easy number to remember. And what is well, so if you look at that, we need to understand what this RDA is, okay? RDA means recommended dietary allowance, which means that you look at a population of people and you tell them, okay, to keep these people healthy, we need so much protein, okay? So what we need to understand is that this RDA or recommended daily protein is not maximum. In my opinion, it is minimum minimal dietary allowance. It should not be maximum. It is not maximum. So when some says, oh, if you're going above RDA, it doesn't make much sense to say, oh, yes, you know, that makes sense. It doesn't. Because we need to understand that it is not, it is only a recommended dietary allowance. It is not the maximum dietary allowance. So what I recommend now for people is that you have to look at how much protein you need 
So to look at how much protein you need, you need to look at a reference point. For example, I am five foot eleven inches tall. Okay, so I my weight should be between seventy and seventy five kgs. Okay, so which means that I need at least seventy to seventy five grams of protein per day, regardless of exercise. That is very important, regardless of exercise, to keep me healthy because that is the RDA recommended daily dose. So we need to make keep that. So if you look at this slide. You you can see that if you fit into any of these uh, heights, that is the amount of weight that you need, and that is the amount of protein you need per day, regardless of exercise. Okay. So what happens to us is that it is not the same for everybody. For example, children need about at least one point four grams per kg body weight, and that reduces over time. Senior citizens, this is not seventy; it's less than that. Need one point to one one to one point three. Imagine telling my mother. To have more protein, she'll freak out because she says, "Why should I eat more chicken? Or why should I eat more egg? I'm growing old." But in fact, she needs more than that, you know. But it's very difficult to tell people and patients that they actually need more protein. So this is this is the challenge. And then we need during during adult during convalescence, during when we have any uh, fever or any infection, it we need at least another fifteen percent to thirty percent extra protein. Okay, I've I've high, I've cut this off because we're not talking about bodybuilders or body sculptors. So if you look at uh, nutrition uh, of protein in in uh, pregnancy during pregnancy, even that goes up to one point four one. So you can our our general population doesn't even hit 0.7 to 0.8. point seven to point eight. Point eight are the lucky people. So imagine telling a pregnant woman. 1.4 grams. They don't know what it means. We don't know what it means, and so this is the problem. That is why I always keep talking about protein. And during lactation as well, the mother needs a quite a bit of protein to make sure that the baby gets that much protein as well. Okay. So what is the challenge, right? So one of the challenges is the nutrition challenge because uh, there are a lot of re reasons why people do not want to eat certain kinds of food. Maybe because of religion. Uh, and fasting and things like that, or it could even be an ethical act. Because right now, what is happening is, if someone is a vegetarian, they will not want to sit to a non sit next to a non vegetarian. Or if you're working in a place which is which is meant only by owned by a vegetarian, they will not let you eat a non vegetarian meal, which becomes a bit of a challenge for people who are not uh, of that faith or whatever. So it becomes an ethical challenge. And then we are told about all these pyramids. These are the old pyramids. The food pyramid, which is absolutely terrible. Now the newest fad is this: choose my plate, or the USD has told us about these plates where they have. Look at this: fruit, grains, vegetable, and protein, and and dairy. Protein is so less, and more of grains. You're getting more carbohydrates. You're not getting up, getting enough protein at all. So this is really totally off the mark. So. One another challenge is that we Indians, generally speaking, are extremely protein shy, and that is the reason why I'm saying that is it because if you look at this these columns over here, we India India is here, so we our animal based protein intake is much lesser than our plant protein intake. But overall, we consume even in Asia, we consume lesser protein than any other population. So this is not me talking, but this is published data. And then you have papers, paper headlines like this: eighty percent Indian diets are protein deficient. Okay, this is another one. Nine out of ten Indians lack adequate protein. Mumbai curd score high. This is not old news. This is two thousand and fifteen, and it's worse now. And then this is a recent publication which shows that this is not. I think it's about two years old. This one shows. This is an IMRB uh, uh, survey which shows that seventy-three percent of urban rich. I'm not talking about people who can't afford. People who can even afford protein, seventy-three percent of them are protein deficient, which is shocking, actually. And and a lot of them have the wrong idea about protein. They many of them don't even know that eighty uh, vegetarian meals have low protein. So it is it is becoming a challenge because people are not. Talked, people are not told what is the right protein, and so they have have the idea that, including my patients, they have the idea that oh, you know, I'm eating enough protein. When I actually ask them how much protein they're eating, they are not. So that becomes a problem. And then the type of food that we eat, also the way we eat our food, is also a challenge. 
now this is a thali but we indians hardly eat thalis even though this is a representative of a indian diet as per what you know books and all show but the, it is generally lower on protein when compared to a western meal for example and i can vouch for that because i when i lived in hong kong i used to have a extremely high protein diet uh, but what happens to this thali is when you go to a restaurant and ask for a thali the waiter will come and ask you so sir what do you want to have in your thali will you have rice idli dosa or will you have puri or batura they will never come and ask you what do you want in the wati these watis actually except for the kheer have got fantastic micronutrients and fantastic proteins if it is a this the dal is thick for example okay not fantastic but good amount and and when it is compared to western diet it is very different generally speaking now it is not true that we indians are very vegetarian in fact a lot of a lot of indians are non vegetarian so i don't understand when people say you should become a vegetarian it's actually not true because this is a this is a national survey organization which has given this data and so what has happened is over the past few years we are seeing a constant decline of protein consumption in india and then the type of proteins that we eat are also becoming a problem because if we eat if we eat protein uh, we are expecting protein to to i mean we expect our foods like dals to give us protein they are not giving us enough protein i'll come to that in a minute the other challenge is digestion is very complex and protein doesn't get absorbed that well so if people are not used to eating protein you give them a high protein diet they will start getting constipated or they will start having problems with digestion so we have to understand that and there are different pathways for protein to you know uh, to get broken down and this is a, a little more complex we'll talk about it some other time but what we need to understand is that it is not just protein so if you ask a patient or if you ask yourself are you eating protein and say yes we need to know what type of protein eating what is the quality of protein how much protein are we eating so there are different ways of assessing proteins and there is some the older way methodology of assessing protein was something called as pd cas that is protein digestibility correct correct digestibility corrected amino acid score it's called pd cas we don't use this anymore but it's still used in some places we use something called as dia dia ss that is a digestible indispensable amino acid score and basically what we do there is we look at this the protein and how much it gets digested how much of the individual protein amino acids get digested and and how much of protein are you getting in the end quality protein so for example a dia dias score will be like this so even though wheat may have protein the amount of protein is low and this is and this even though people say it is eligible for claim based on quantity is high people say yeah yeah it got protein but actually it is it doesn't have any claim on quality okay so if you look at peas it is the same it has got very low quality protein but if you look at milk powder for example it has got a very high protein now one thing i have to make clear is that milk is not vegetarian it comes from a cow so it is a non vegetarian product but we have given it a green label which is fine i'm not i'm not worried about that but at least most of our indians are not vegans we are lacto vegetarians which means that we eat dairy products which is the savior for us so if you look at other there's another way of looking at proteins and each of these proteins like uh, meat or milk which is casein is paneer this is something called as biological value anything anything above about 80 is good so if you look at whey protein is pretty good peanuts and all have soy and all have got actually quality of protein is not good even though the quantity of protein may be good okay so the question then comes uh, is like where do i get my proteins from so most people say you know what i eat i can't eat my food without roti or rice okay so you just focus on this this is uncooked food and focus on this column here the protein column or uh, so if you take a 100 grams of let's say rice okay 100 grams of rice it has 6.8 grams of protein okay uh, but it has 78 grams of carbohydrates now it is not really true that bajra and you know wheat or jowar have got that much lesser carbo lesser carbohydrate than rice 
they're pretty much not that different if you look at the carbohydrate column. So when I'm, when some of my patients tell me, no sir, ham chapati ne rice ne kate, ham chapati kate because rice has got a lot of carbohydrates. I tell them generally jokingly, I'm a South Indian. I eat rice. Like you're insulting me. But then the, the the point I'm trying to drive is that the carbohydrate content is not that different. The protein content exactly are all not that different, but they're very low in protein. What about the dals? Everybody says, oh, I'm eating a dal, you know, some type of dal, Bengal gram, which is also called, I think it's called sattu. And then we have different types of tuar dals and all these things. So do they have protein? Look at this protein column. Yes, they have good protein. They have actually good protein. But look at the carb column. They have a lot of carbs. Okay. So if you look at something like rajma, which is which is a very which is one of my favorite ones, which is you take a hundred grams, it has got 22.9% protein, quite good protein. But look at the amount of carbs, 60.6. You can't eat a hundred grams of rajma or you can't eat a hundred grams of dal, any of the dals, because a hundred grams of dal will have so much of carbohydrate, it will be half a vessel full. So even though you get in half a vessel full so much protein, 20 grams of protein, you cannot physically eat it. So we have to keep that in mind. What about milk? So milk has got good protein, but it depends on the quality of milk. Okay, so 100 grams of 100 ml or 200 ml of milk will have about two or eight grams of protein. Whereas milk powder on the last one has got good amount of protein. Okay, so milk has protein, but it depends on the quality of milk that one takes. What about curds? Because we have consumed curds a bit, right? Curds have also about 100 grams of, or 200 grams of curd, one bowl has about eight grams of protein. So that can add to the amount of protein that you eat. And buttermilk has naturally is watered down, so it has got a lower amount of protein. Uh, milk, soy milk has got good amount of protein, but the problem is the quality of that protein. What about uh, chapati and baturas and all these things? They also have very good low, they have protein. Nature doesn't have anything without protein, but they're very low amount of protein, but a high amount of carbohydrates. But compare that to, compare that to, let me go to the next one, dals and all that we just spoke about. Compare that to a non-vegetarian meal, for example. If you look at the protein level of this non-vegetarian meal, it gives you, you know, look at this is Bombay duck, Bombay's favorite uh, fish. 61% protein. But what is important is, even though it gives so much of protein, it doesn't give that much carbs. You can see this column. Remember, when you look at dal, it's something like 50 to 60%. But here you're looking at very low, 25 to 3%. Crabs has got probably one of the highest. But look at that. This is nothing compared to the dals that, can, that have a lot of carb on it. So you can easily eat 100 grams of Bombay duck to get 61 grams of protein. Bombay duck, 100 grams is like two fish. Easy to eat. Because there's no volume, there's no carbohydrate, but you can't eat 100 grams of dal. And, and, and that's the same with the other uh, things like fish, chicken. So chicken is there, 25.9%. And 200 grams of chicken, if you want 50 grams of protein, is very little. It's not that much in quantity. Okay. So that is what I'm trying to say. Now, this is one article which is nobody, I'm sure many people have not read. I, I found it some time back, which is fantastic. It's not very old, 2018. It says, dear vegetarians, your dal is not providing you with enough protein, which is true because the, the, the amount of dal we eat and how we cook it is not going to give you that much protein. Okay. So this is just a measure of amount of food that we eat. For example, if someone says one wati, we should know what, what one wati is. If someone says one cup, we should know what one cup is. If someone says one teaspoon, we should know how much a teaspoon is. So what does it mean? So what does one gram per kg body weight mean? So if you are, if you if you need if you need eighty, if you're, suppose you need eighty grams of protein, you per day you have to eat a hundred grams of sprouts, two hundred grams of paneer, hundred grams of thick, very thick dal, not thin dal, not watery dal, hundred grams of jowar or rice, one fifty grams, and two helpings of vegetables. That will give you eighty grams of protein every day. For a non-vegetarian, it's two eggs, two hundred grams of chicken. 250 grams of, 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 of fish, some vegetables, and, and you know, if, if people are into rice or roti, they can have that. So there is a big difference in the quantity, one, but people have to consistently have this, which is not a possibility with most people. So if you look at the, so in many people, we need to supplement the, the protein. So the protein has to be palatable, digestible, cost-effective. Protein is not cheap. Whatever you take, even if you take 
100 grams of dal, it is not cheap. 100 grams of chicken is not cheap. So protein is a little like, it is expensive compared to uh, rice or, or, or compared to a carb meal. So that is one of the challenges that we face. So basically we need to make sure that we supplement proteins for people. And my protein prescriptions are naturally uh, seafood, meats, uh, meat, eggs, dal, soya. For some people who really cannot eat other things, paneer or cereals, very rarely cereals. Uh, but um, when, when they can take supplements, I ask them to buy either whey or casein or sometimes add branch BCAAs. Plant proteins are new because a lot of vegans in. They are, I think, pretty good, but I've not had fantastic results, but I think they should work. We need, I need some more time to see my patients doing better on plant proteins, uh, especially for vegans who don't have any, they don't eat meat, sorry, they don't eat even dairy products. Um, soya is another choice, uh, challenging for some, but mostly uh, okay. If people really cannot take proteins and they're really incapacitated, amino acid, uh, uh, um, uh, IV amino acids are possibly one of the choices. Spirulina is a good choice, but you can't eat a lot of spirulina. So in some pro supplements, depending on the type of supplements, the protein can range from 10% to 40%. The powders that you get, whey and casein, the usual, the big dabbas that you get, uh, they have in one scoop, usually 30 grams, they give you about 24 grams of protein. That's an international standard. One, another thing is that people say, I'm eating high protein, but they don't know really what high protein is, including many of the physicians and nutritionists. Sometimes when they say high protein, I, I ask, what do you mean by high? Because people say, I'm high protein. Khata. I say, like, how much is high? No, it's not dal. Khata. So we eat that much chicken. I said, that's not high. So we need to define what high is. I define high as above 1.5 gram and above, I define as high. Okay, But that doesn't mean it's bad. It's just needed for people who need that much protein. So we need to understand what this high protein means. Okay, Now, uh, is consuming high protein harmful? Not at all. Not at all. If one has a kidney problem, that is a different thing. But for general population, not a problem at all. And even going up to about three grams per kg body weight has not been a problem at all for people who are normal. Now, uh, the misconceptions when it comes to protein that only bodybuilders need proteins. A lot of my patients have this challenge because they'll say, why are you giving your supplements for bodybuilders? And I said, no, 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 it's not for bodybuilders. We consume less protein, so you have to take it. You know, only endurance proteins uh, are, or the endurance athletes need protein. Eating a high protein will cause unwanted weight gain, which is not true. Because if you improve your muscle, your fat will drop naturally. Carbohydrates are the most important fuel for exercise, which is seriously not true. Um, uh, we need, we need energy from fat as well, which can do. Okay, and proteins can end, damage and normally function. So, now when you have patients... Sorry. Sorry, Satya. Satya. I just, I just, uh, I just muted Satya. <laughs> ah, that's better. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay. Ila, I, ma, ma, Satya, mute, Mari. Okay. So basically, when I, when patients come to me, I have to measure oh, their yeah. muscle. Okay, because without that muscle, without that muscle, they really cannot, uh, they cannot, uh, you know, uh, understand how much of protein they have. So. The ways of uh, uh, looking into how much muscle, how much fat one has, because then you can actually address that. If someone's fat level is above more than 30% to 40%, then you can assess that and tell them, okay, you have so much fat, out of your 70 kgs, 30% or 50% is fat. So without knowing your body composition is difficult. You know, just looking at the weight, you can't assess what the quality of where that weight belongs. So we can measure different, uh, there are different ways of measuring that. DEXA is one of the best. Or you have these scales, which are called body composition scales, which are very important. And that, that is very, it's very affordable these days. I, most of my patients buy them. And, and they measure it and they send me their details. So we can also measure patients' hand strength grip by using a simple thing called a dynamometer. It costs only about 400 rupees or 500 rupees. And this grip strength is seriously very important. It is the simplest way to know to check how early one will die. In other words, it's a very good indicator for mortality by using just a hand grip strength. And of course, performance. 
So this is an example of a, a scale called as a body composition scale. So if this patient is 88 kg, 80.78, we can hear that this patient had 42.3% of that body weight as fat, okay? And the skeletal muscle is 33.6. So naturally, this they had, what I tell this patient is you have to reduce your fat level, which is severely high, and we need to increase the skeletal muscle uh, by taking more protein and, and, and doing exercise. So then we can monitor that as we go along. So that is the advantage of having a body composition scale. So I'm going to stop here. And then take any question directly. <clears throat> so please unmute yourself, everybody. Yeah.